Let's be seated. God is good. Welcome everybody. We have come to a season of assurance because there are certain things that can only be operated on when we are very conversant and aware of the assurance that we have been given. So come with me to Matthew chapter 7 and let us take a look at the way heaven presents assurance in some of the clearest and simplest possible ways. Matthew chapter 7 verse 7. I will appreciate a little paper napkin if anyone has one nearby. Praise the Lord. Don't be afraid. I'm not about to cry. I need you for something else. God is good. So there's a lot of them around here. I see them. Th that box may be empty, but there's another one over there. If you just can, that'll be great. Set a fire down in my soul that I can control. Hallelujah. Come on, praise the Lord. I like the fact that when we were singing that song, I believe Brother Ron said something like, I wouldn't control it. There was a time that he inter interrupted the, the regular uh, lyrics and said that he would not control it. Because sometimes, because of the willpower that God has given to us, we try to control it. Whereas the Bible says the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Why don't we just bow our heads for a moment? And remind yourself of the expectation that you have for the presence of the presence of the Lord tonight. Because we need to learn to always have an expectation of that presence. What have we in mind? What are we looking to tap into as we come into that presence? And let us keep that hope alive. And if you didn't have time to set an expectation it's a good time for you to just go ahead and just say, you know what? With where I'm at, with where things are at, I need to know exactly what the Spirit of the Lord is saying unto the churches. Lord, open my eyes that I may see those great and mighty things that I do not know, that I may see plainly that which the Lord is ready to do in order for me to be in full swing with the leading of the Holy Spirit. In the mighty name of Jesus, praise the Lord. God is good. So before we get right into it, Emmanuel is going to help me a little bit here with some of the final uh, tuning so that I can sound uh, a little better. God is good. So Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. Um, anyone read Matthew lately? Okay. See, Matthew is one of those books that I want to actually read and I want people to come um, and read it along with me. So it's one of those things that I'm, I've been thinking about doing this for a while, just to invite people to come online and read the word with me. And, oh, praise the Lord. Um, I think so. I think we're there, Emmanuel. That's excellent. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. God is good. Yep, this is great. Or maybe just a little less reverb, just a little less, at least for my monitors here. Thank you. God is good. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Praise the Lord. If, if we had someone like Emmanuel at the church that I was at growing up, I probably would have been a better singer. Because they always put me on the same microphone settings as everybody else, and then I would sound like they don't want to hear. I remember my, um, my pastor at the time, the children's pastor, who was also a personal mentor to me, she was the one present in the day that the Lord took me up in the spirit. The very first time that I would recall being slain in the spirit for an extended period of time. I may have been gone for about two, three hours. The church was closed. Everyone went home. Everybody else came, took their kids. But then my parents weren't saved yet, so they wouldn't even come to church. And the woman was like, I'm not going to carry an unconscious baby back to her parents or back to his parents. His parents. I was born a guy and I'm still a guy. Just making sure that that was not a slip off, you know. So, and so she, she stayed there and she was like, I will wait here. And I remember that when I woke up and I saw her, she was the only person in the room, pretty much the only person left in the church apart from security. I knew 
that what I was seeing was the face of someone who is joyful on behalf of another. She had prayed and bawled her eyes out. And I will never forget, even though I woke up and I knew that I had been somewhere and things had been done to me, but I couldn't tell what it was. But this lady, she said to me one day, just out of compassion, she said, I want you because of the life that you have. You're very lively. You're excited to be here. But don't let any sound come out of your mouth. Yeah, just open your mouth and close it. So I stood there and we sang about a couple of songs and the entire time I was just like, and nothing was coming out because they said that I had a baritone voice, but that was just a way of encouraging me to keep coming, but not sing. But thank God for Emmanuel, because I think he's got a gift of making me sound like I can actually sing. Praise the Lord. So Matthew chapter 7, I would read to us from verse 7, and it says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. You know, I asked if any one of us has been reading Matthew lately, uh, not just because I'm planning to do a, a reading program, just to encourage people, you know, uh, get more familiar with the Word of God. Um, I believe it's also going to be an avenue for me to share with people the way that I studied the Word of God and help several others to overcome the things that I had to overcome, you know, because it wasn't always easy to actually study the Word, to understand what is being said, to be able to retain what is being read, and more importantly, to yield oneself to the word for transformation because it is not just enough for us to know the word it is more critical for us to allow ourselves to be known by the word because the word of god god knows us he knows who we are but we need to be conscious of how much we are known paul said that i may know as i am known that i may come to the full knowledge of the reason why i was comprehended i was apprehended he says that i may come to comprehend that for which i was apprehended it is critical for us to be able to look at it and it's not mythical or magical there are simple steps that one takes in order to get to that place of being able to bond with the word. The book of Matthew especially is one that allows for us to be able to see things from more than just one perspective. Because if you remember correctly, I have shared with you a couple of times that Matthew was one of those people that recorded the things that happened in the time of Jesus from a perspective of the spirit as well as the natural. You know, when you look at the accounts of people like Luke and Mark, they would register a miracle that happened and they would just say, oh, this miracle happened to one person. How many people remember the mad, the mad man of the, of the Gadgetines, of Gadara? When this man was healed, I believe it was Luke that also reported what happened. He says there was one man. And there was another account of two people that were healed uh, of blindness. The other account said one man. But I went to the Lord and I said, okay, are we looking at a discrepancy here because of how people took notes and how people recorded what they saw? And the response that the Holy Spirit gave to me was that Matthew, because of his diligence and attentiveness to, to details, because he was a tax collector, so he had to be able to see what people were showing him and what they were hiding from him. Okay, because tax collectors back in the day would rely on what you're telling them that you make or that you have. But God forbid that the Roman lords that they reported to find out that they are bringing in less taxes than the people were meant to pay. So they had to develop the ability to see the unseen. And Jesus made it very clear, abundantly clear, why he called him. When he called him. Because until Jesus called Matthew, Nobody saw the other party or group of people that Jesus came for. Up until Jesus called Matthew, everybody was looking in one direction with one track mind. They were looking to see if this was the Messiah of the lost sheep of Israel. But the moment he called Matthew, the Bible says, Jesus called Matthew and he said to him, you are a tax collector, but I need you on my team. Follow me. The Bible says from that moment onward, 
tax collectors and sinners came to dine with him. And that was what began to anger the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Jews who felt like they had all the rights to the Messiah started to notice that maybe indeed there might be another reason why he came. So Matthew was one of those people that God brought to the team and brought on board to allow for us to see more than just the one, for us to see the two, to see the Jew and to see the Gentile, to see the natural olive and to see the wild olive. The ministry of Matthew is a, map, is a ministry that presented both perspectives. That is the reason why when Jesus healed the madman of Gadara, Matthew said there were two men. The other account said there was one man. And that one man that they saw continually was the man that they wanted to see, and that was themselves. But Matthew was able to see beyond himself. He was able to see the others. And so when you read the book of Matthew, Matthew is, in fact, really a gift. Maybe that's the reason why he was called Matthew. Because the word Matthew is from the word Matthias, which means God's own gift. And so I want to encourage you, if you haven't taken the liberty of understanding what we have in this particular witness, re-examine and examine. Throw yourself into the study of the word. And so Matthew chapter 7 verse 7, the Bible says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it shall be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and he who seeks finds and to him who knocks it will be opened. What a divine assurance that we have. We have such an assurance that if we would ask, it will be given to us. You know what wisdom said to Solomon in Proverbs chapter 8? Wisdom said to Solomon, I am the principal thing. Even before the primal dust of the earth was formed, the Almighty possessed me from the beginning of his ways. He says, I am the one who was there. I witnessed creation. And by me, a man will find life. By me, a man will remain in righteousness. And wisdom says, and I am not that hard to find. In fact, because God knows how important I am in the lives of his children, he's made an assurance that anyone who seeks me finds me. It says, if you seek me, you will find me. The only clause or caveat that wisdom introduced to Solomon was that you have to seek me diligently. One of the things that God encourages or what God seeks in our relationship with him is not just for us to have power. God wants us to have strength. You know, power is instantaneous. I can give you a mighty blow that will show how much power that I have. But can I keep punching you even when it doesn't seem to be making any difference to you. That is strength. Strength is the ability to sustain, whereas power is just the measure of force. Many of us, we like power because it's instant. But what God is looking for is strength. You know, many a times in the ministry of Jesus, and we're going to come back to this assurance in just a minute, and the reason why it is important for us to switch into an assurance mindset in this season that we're in. We're going to come into that, but I just want to quickly explain to us very briefly the difference between having power and strength. What God gives to you is power. What you develop on your own is strength. You see, the Bible says that when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were together in one place and in one accord. And there came from heaven a sound as of a rushing, might, rushing mighty wind. And it filled the room where they were in. And there appeared upon each and every one of them divided tongues as of fire. And they were filled with the Holy Ghost. That was the power that was promised. Jesus says, wait in Jerusalem until you receive the power that is coming from on high. However, all of that beautiful experience was in Acts chapter 2. And in Acts chapter 3, because they had just received the power, the power in its potency was still very much on the surface. It was readily accessible. They went to the synagogue 
And on their way to the synagogue, they got to the gate that is called Beautiful, and there was a man there. And I want to encourage you. Let me say this. I don't say this enough, but I want to say this because I don't know how much longer we have to continue equipping and being equipped. Because equipping is not forever. Because we have not been called to the ministry of eternal equipping. The Bible did not say you shall be equipped forever according to the order of Melchizedek. No, the Bible says that we are blessed forever and we overcome eternally, but equipping is seasonal. So we need to understand that there is a window of time wherein we are prepared by the Lord. The Lord says it this way. He says, in two days, I will prepare my people, and on the third day, I will come for them. So two days of preparation, and then one day of visitation. So if we have, or I would say, if we do not have such a mindset, we do not allow ourselves to be to enjoy the, 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 the quickening or the um, divine acceleration that is available to us when it comes to growing in the things of the Holy Spirit. So that's why I say I don't know how much longer we have, but one thing that I do know that in this season, we have to draw all of what is being made available to us. We need to draw all of what has been made available to us. We need to learn how to hear very quickly. We need to learn how to be slow to speak, slow to anger, slow to wrath. We need to be able to read the signals that are in the heavens. We need to be able to understand the whisper that is in the heart. In the season that we are in, it is important for us as part of our equipping to learn how to be fruit bearers and to learn most especially how to be led by the Holy Spirit and not by another simply because as the days are drawing nearer and nearer the influence of the two forces that are at war will become increased or we're going to feel them we're going to feel them more there will be an increase in the flux of the powers of these two forces that are at war the bible says there was war in the heavens and that war is still ongoing. You know, when the Bible says we do not wrestle, it didn't stop there. It just says we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. So that means we do wrestle. We're at war. Constantly, we're at war. Thoughts come to your mind to shift your perspective, and you have to resist those thoughts. Even when people are not, even when Satan cannot find enough people to come and annoy you, you are enough to annoy yourself. There are certain times wherein you talk yourself down. And I had an opportunity earlier to have a conversation with, uh, with, with John and our dear brother and his wife. Good to see you. I'm glad you all made it to service uh, tonight. We had a conversation earlier on, and I, was, I shared with them about the fact that whenever we have a call that is a genuine call by God, there is an assurance of what to experience when that call comes and what is guaranteed when you're called by God. Tribulations and trials. When Jesus sent out his disciples, the very first time that he sent them out, before he told them that, oh, oh, you're going to cast out devils and all of that stuff, the exciting part, he told them, he says, as you are going out, I'm sending you out as sheep among wolves. He says they will persecute you. They will trouble you. He says, I have not come so that people can like you. He says, I have come to bring a sword upon the earth, to turn the daughter against the mother, the son against the father. He says, a man's enemies, in fact, at some point, it will be as if the ones who hate you the most are the ones of your household. And when he was declaring all of those to his disciples, he was letting them know what David had prophesied when David said, the zeal of the Lord's house has consumed me and made me a reproach even to my mother's children. You see, that is the truth that we were denied. Growing up and getting excited at, at ministry, the kind of enemies that were presented to us were not even the real enemies. A lot of what people were told when they were getting ready to go into ministry was how to raise money for missions, how to secure buildings and how to buy equipment. Whereas Mammon was not the real enemy, 
The real enemy are the people to whom you have been sent. And it is guaranteed that it is going to be that way. And that is the reason why it is war almost without end. But the beauty of it is that we know that there is an end. And the Bible says the ones who overcome shall receive a crown of glory. Praise the Lord. So when I tell you that we have come to a season of overcoming, it is another way of saying that we have come to a season wherein we would have to use that which we have been equipped with. Because you don't just overcome, you have to be overcoming something. You see? And so I tell you that because I wanted to tell you this. That as we have come into this season and we know that the equipping is what we have been enjoying and it might not continue forever, what do we begin to do? We begin to learn how to apply ourselves and how to apply the equipping. So I want to beseech you by the mercies of God to dedicate and to devote time on your own to the study of the word of God. Because there are certain times that I come in here and I start telling stories as though I am telling it to people who are familiar with the parables, who are familiar with the prophets, who are familiar with the apostles, who are familiar with the ministry of Jesus. But the reality of it is that some of us cannot even tell how many times Jesus fed thousands of people. Many of us forget, was it one time or two times? There was a 5,000, there was a 4,000? Was it just a discrepancy in records or did it happen at two separate, separate times? In order for us to make the most of the privilege that we have in this season of equipping, we need to also be ready to do some homework. So I was telling you the story of how Jesus sent out his disciples and he said to them that I send you out as sheep amongst wolves. And they were excited. They were fired up. And because it was the first time they came back and the testimonies were like amazing. They were like, even before we spoke, as soon as we showed up, demons were running away from us. Right, Peter? Yeah, and we're like, yeah, absolutely. Jesus was like, okay, I see you. We're just giving you a sample just to encourage you to come in. But when Jesus was going to the cross and when Jesus was going to heaven after he was raised from the dead, he told his disciples, he was like, I know what you all can be like. You're very excited but do not go in your own power. He says, do not go anywhere, not even in my name, until you have received power from on high. That power came on the day of Pentecost. They received that power. They moved in that power. Acts chapter two, power came. Acts chapter three, power went out. They were using the power. They were to the man by the gate called beautiful. They said to him, Silver and gold we do not have, but what we have we give. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. And they looked at each other and they were like, wow, this is amazing. I can do this forever. Like just use the name of Jesus and miracles begin to happen like this. Let's do this all day. Sign me up. But guess what happened by the beginning of Acts chapter 4? The powers that be had come to recognize that there was also power that was opposing their power. And the moment you begin to show power that is noticeable by the darkness, then they will abandon whatever it is they're doing and make you, you and your power their mission. And it's not a bad place to be. You see, we're not supposed to be believers who shy away from, from war, from battles, from opposition. You know, I told you a while ago that one of the things that Satan did to the body of Christ was convince us that we were not an army. It's one of the greatest tricks that he ever pulled, that we're not an army, that we don't have to worry about wars, that we don't have to wrestle against principalities and powers. We just need to focus on finding principles in scripture that would allow for us to excel in the workplace, make more money, and be able to go on more vacations. The attention was turned on acquiring material things and enjoying pleasure to the point wherein when you... Tell people who are going through difficulties that it is the will of God for them to be challenged and tried in such a way that we say, no, 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 Jesus says my burden is light and my yoke is easy. One of the conversations we had earlier was this. There were people who came from amongst us who were sent out to go and begin meetings at their houses. And after the one or two meetings that they had, they experienced great spiritual opposition. And they were like, definitely this cannot be God. 
And I'm like, uh, why? In fact, a, a couple told us, they said, before we started the meeting, while we were just attending your meeting, we bought a brand new car, the first car that we ever had that was brand new. We bought a brand new house, the first house that we would ever buy. And as soon as we started the meeting, everything went south. We lost businesses, we lost money and we lost face. And I was like, but that is awesome. Because now you know you are on the right path. Oh, there's no more amen except for Shannon. Or, or who was that? Well, oh, I praise God for you. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because, you know, the reality of it is we need to get ourselves to the point wherein we know what excites God and allow ourselves to be excited by the same. You know, the Bible says when Jesus was going to the cross, he was about to be crucified. The Bible says for the joy that was set before him. He saw that as a joyful thing. That meant these people would not have to suffer because I would take all the suffering for them. And that was the reason why the disciples, the apostles, after they were, after they started getting noticed by the authorities, they were brought out into the town square and they were beaten. Remember what happened to them? When they were flogged because they were preaching in the name of Jesus, what happened to them? The Bible says that they began to rejoice after they had been beaten, black and blue, they began to rejoice. And why were they rejoicing? They said, even are we, we, who are we? To be counted worthy to suffer in his name. They were not fools. They were wise men who understood how things work in the kingdom. Because they know that anyone who suffers in his name. You see, when Jesus told them that they will persecute you, he said they will hate you for my name's sake. He said, he said they will even disown you. He said some of you, you will lose fathers and brothers and sisters. They will say they do not know you anymore. He said, be of good cheer. He says, because as many of you as are willing to give up those things, you will find it in the world to come. I want you to be genuinely excited because there is power and there is strength. I want us to be able to understand how we transition from being people who experience the power of God to people who actually move in the strength of God. So what did they receive? They received power. They were able to pray for someone who was crippled from birth. He got up and he walked. Acts chapter 3. The next chapter, what happened? Acts chapter 4. And in Acts chapter 4, the authorities had noticed that there was an opposition, that these people are no longer to be trifled with. We thought one of them was bad enough. We took him out. That was the Lord Jesus. But now there are several of them, and we need to act. And so what did they do? Acts chapter 4 opened with a statement that the authorities came together, and they forbade children, I mean the apostles, from using the name of Jesus. They came against them and they said, you can no longer use that name. And as soon as they said that, it almost took the wind out of the apostles. Because that is all they had known. They had known power. And God wants to teach them now how to be able to sustain power in the face of opposition, which is what strength is. Can I say that again? Sustaining power in the face of opposition is what strength is. I sought the Lord concerning the things that he was showing me because I saw power being released upon us. We're going to see a lot of the manifestation of the power of the Holy Spirit on the fourth when we come here by the grace of God. And one of the things that the Holy Spirit brought to my attention, praise the Lord, only man leader was excited when I said there is going to be a manifestation of power. Oh yeah, but do we need to serve coffee so people can be awake in here? And the Holy Spirit said to me, however, we're looking for faithful custodians. Faithful custodians. You see, when God releases power, he doesn't want power that will be delivered and not sustained. Because when Jesus was teaching his disciples what it means to be empowered by one kingdom in order to advance over another kingdom, one of the things that he said to them 
was that they need to learn how to sustain the power in the face of tribulation, in the face of challenges, how to hold their own without losing faith. Because it is critical for us. And one of the things that he told them was this. Chris, Jesus said to them, he says, do not cast your pearl before swine. He said, what we're giving to you, he said, what I'm giving to you is something holy. Do not allow your holy things to be given to dogs. He says, do not give holy things to dogs. Neither should you cast your pearl before swine. Let me explain that. Because many of us, sometimes we don't really see dogs the way people saw dogs in the time of Jesus. Because a lot of our dogs today have become very sophisticated. They eat food that comes out of a box. They eat food that is in a can. You go to line up at some restaurant at the end of every day so that your dog can get chicken that was not served or paid for. They eat sophisticated food. But in the time of Jesus, dogs were not fed they would, they, fend, they would have to fend for themselves. Because there was no degree of sophistication. Dogs were not pets. They were, they were animals that were domesticated to be used in hunting. They were used to provide some kind of alertness. They were kind of like an alarm system. There was no um, ATA or whatever it is that we use these days that install alarms. You had dogs for that, to be barking all day long. You don't feed them. They go to eat scrap. If you don't believe me, visit some of these third world countries and you will see that dogs still fend for themselves and what they eat and feed on is what is they feed on what people have thrown out they feed on dirt and without grossing you out they feed on things that have come out of people that was what they were known for and so when jesus says do not give holy things to dogs he was letting them know the kind of people they needed to be aware of. The apostle Paul, I believe it was, he told us, beware of dogs. It might have been Peter who said, beware of what? Of dogs. And a lot of us, in fact, myself and my wife, we had to learn how to beware of dogs. Because let me tell you how to easily identify the people that God does not want you to waste your holy things on. When you see people who feed on drama, They are dogs, right? They're always looking for filth. If everywhere is peaceful and everyone is friendly for longer than two weeks, they have to make something up. And every now and again, they are always looking for dirt to feed on. You may want to talk to them about the book of Matthew and the revelations that you're getting, and they want to talk about someone else's dirt with you. Because while you are feeding on the word and feeding on good news and testimonies, they look for dirt. They're like, have you heard? They are dogs. They're different from swine. Swine is another word for pigs. So if you search the word of God, if you search the Bible for pigs, especially the New King James Bible or the King James Bible, you will find no pig. The word being used is swine. And swine are different from dogs, but also similar in a way. So dogs feed on dirt. Pigs enjoy being in dirt. So those people, that no matter how much you try to help them, no matter how much we try to counsel them, no matter how much they pray and we pray for them, they always find themselves back into dirt one way or the other. Jesus says don't waste time with them because those two categories of people, after you have fed them, they will come back to bite you. Now, why was Jesus telling them that? Wouldn't you wonder? Because I wondered. I couldn't tell, I can't tell you how many times I've read that passage of scripture and sought the Lord, saying, Lord, what is, what, what, where does this fit in the overall picture? You were just telling these people that there is an assurance that whatever they ask, they will receive. You've given them an assurance. They don't have to worry about anything. They just have to ask and receive. And Jesus said to me, by the ministry of the Holy Spirit, that that is the reason why he was telling them about the dogs and the swine, because heaven guarantees that you will have everything that you need to carry out your assignment. From heaven's perspective, you will receive everything you ask. 
But the reality of it is that it is now left for you to be able to preserve what you have. If you ask for power, heaven will give it to you. But Satan also knows that when you have power, you are dangerous. So he sends you people that you will waste that power on. You know, in this season of overcoming, I told you that I would be sharing with us things that allow for us to maintain what heaven is bringing to us by the grace of God. We didn't beg to overcome. We didn't even know that we needed to overcome. Because when you are dead, you don't even know you're dead. Did Lazarus beg God to be woken up from sleep? He didn't know he was already dead and gone. He was sleeping in the bosom of Abraham waiting for the resurrection. But God, in his mercy, came and demonstrated that when he calls somebody to be a witness, even if they are dead, they would have to rise up. Because we know that Lazarus was born to be a witness to Jesus Christ. That was why he was called Lazarus. His name means the one who has help. And so when Jesus came as the help, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. And everybody that heard it seemed to be alive. So they didn't need resurrection. So they thought. So he needed a witness who was already dead. So that he can bear witness to the fact that Jesus was the resurrection and the life. But I tell you what, Lazarus on his own did not know what was going on. He relied on the program of heaven to unfold to that particular point wherein he was needed to be resurrected. Now I say that so that I can also say this. You see... Heaven has guaranteed that you will have everything that you need. It is now up to you to maintain what you are given. So when Jesus told them, we're going to give you power, you're going to go out there, you will do awesome things. He started to tell them things that would help them to maintain the power. So what did I tell you last time I was here? I told you that one of the biggest ways to lose your winning streak as an overcomer is to allow offense to come into your heart. Is to allow for yourself to keep grudge. Is to allow for little things to have a hold on your heart. If you are claiming to be an overcomer in Christ Jesus and yet your neighbor's lawnmower can make you lose your cool. What kind of overcomer are you? The fact that your neighbor has refused to buy a leaf blower that is somewhat silent. And he chooses to use it at 6 a.m. while men sleep. You wake up and the first thing that comes out of your mouth is a swear word. How dare this, this and that. Heaven is not looking for people that cannot maintain you see i'm going to say this and then i'm going to come back to i want to i want you to see how strength and power how they relate with one another going back to the apostles they had power they were able to heal the sick but then in the face of opposition that power was being challenged what was required of them was to maintain that power so what did they do they remembered what jesus said Jesus said men ought always to pray and not to faint. So the moment they put an embargo on the gospel by saying you can no longer preach in the name of Jesus, which nearly took the wind out of them, they became faint-hearted temporarily and then remember that, okay, wait a minute, it's okay to feel faint, it's just not okay to remain faint. Alan got it. You see... <laughs> Any one of us can be faint-hearted, but we cannot afford to stay faint-hearted. Any one of us can receive power. You see, power only works for you as a believer when you maintain it. And fear only works against you when you retain it. So when you feel faint-hearted, what do you do? You pray so that you can spring out of it very quickly because it is not the instance of it that matters. It is the maintenance of it that matters. So the instance of power that they received was not what matters. What God was looking for is, will these people be able to maintain this power consistently, which is what we call strength. I've seen men with mightier muscles than me get defeated 
in arm wrestling because what they have is power. They haven't developed the strength. Anybody can just have the power to grip you. But if you have the power to sustain, after a while they will get tired and you can overpower them. So strength is what is more important. And I know what some of you all might be thinking. You may be thinking the Bible says that by strength shall no man prevail. No, you will prevail not by your strength. You will prevail by his strength. And his strength is first of all introduced to you as power. And then you have to learn how to maintain it. So one of the things that we do to maintain the power and the position of being overcomers is to not allow offense to come in to rob us of our purity. Because the Bible says, Jesus himself speaking, he says, if you forgive others, your heavenly father will forgive you. He said, but slow down. If you do not forgive other people, forget about forgiveness. And so there is a condition that has been placed on your ability to continually be able to access the power without profaning it. I know that we are in a time wherein people continue to preach so-called gospel of grace. I remember there was a Bible scholar who came to me from a very known Bible school in the United States of America. When I was growing up, it was the only Bible school that I knew of, the first one that I knew of. A graduate of the Bible school and someone who had been in the ministry at the time, maybe 30-something years. And they came to me and they said that I have heard you say that if I don't forgive somebody else, I will not be forgiven. He said that is Old Testament. I said, okay, how is that Old Testament? He said, because Jesus had not gone to the cross when he said that. I said, okay. So when he came from the cross, did he say that, I'm sorry for what I said earlier, it's no longer valid. I said, should we still pray in the manner that Jesus taught us, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name? He said, yes. He said, but that part, I said, no. If you say that we should pray like that, don't say but. You cannot cherry pick what the Lord has said. Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away before any jot or tittle of what I say will pass away. He didn't say what the prophet said. He didn't say what the law says. He says, whatever it is that I say, every single thing that Jesus uttered is valid. Jesus told Nicodemus before he went to the cross that you must be born again. Do we still need to be born again to see the kingdom of God? The answer is yes. So if Jesus says, if you do not forgive others, then your heavenly father will not forgive you. What he is saying is the grace that is available to save you from your sins need to be accessed by the mercy of God. And if you do not know how to show mercy, then you cannot receive mercy. Matthew chapter five, Jesus says, blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. So you cannot claim that the grace of God has forgiven you while you are holding other people in unforgiveness, is that grace now a respecter of persons? These things have to be corrected because people are out there, some of them innocently deceived, some of them pompously confused because some people are just too proud to admit the truth and some people are too in the flesh to even submit to the authority of the word of God. They just want everything to happen the way they say it. The reality of it is this, God wants you to operate in power. He wants you to be an overcomer. But at the end of the day, what are you extending to other people? Jesus told his disciples, the very first charge that he gave them when he was sending them out, the very first time, what did he tell them? He said to them, he says, freely have you received, therefore freely give. If I have received forgiveness, I have to give forgiveness. And you know one of the things that we need to understand about strength is this. When you allow so much gap in your ability to maintain power, even if at the end of the day you have some kind of strength, it becomes weak because there are too many weak lines in your cord of strength. And so how do you stop yourself from having gap in your cord? It's like someone gives you a rope. Ayana, someone gives you a rope with which to pull down a load. And then they take a, scissors, a pair of scissors and cut gaps in the rope. You still have a rope. It is still continuous, but it is partially broken. And when it is broken like that, you stand the risk of it snapping while you are yet to get the work done. Do you know how many people had their ministries terminated in the book of Acts just because they took offense at what Paul was doing? Remember that Paul and Barnabas were doing the work of the ministry. 
And Paul says, by the leading of the Holy Spirit, it has come to my knowledge that we should not take this man with us. And Barnabas was like, you don't tell me what to do. I've been saved before you. You were saved just yesterday. You used to be an evil man. If not that we were nice to you and brought you in. Who are you? And so he decided to ignore what Paul had received from the Holy Spirit because he felt like he was of a higher status. That was the last time his name was mentioned in the epistles. So how do you ensure that you do not have gaps in your cord of power? It is very simple. Do not allow the sun to go down on your anger. When someone annoys you, the Bible says be angry but do not sin. To sin is to stay there. When someone annoys you and you're angry, do not sustain the grudge. I know that so many of us are really eager now to go from one to two and two to three. But the way you're going to go from one to two and two to three is having the understanding that it is not worth your while to allow yourself to be mad at anyone. Greek or barbarian? Wise or unwise? That was what I shared with you on Tuesday. Now, what I'm sharing with you in addition to that is that in order for you to maintain that strength, one thing is very critical. The secret to strength is joy. The Bible says the joy of the Lord. Oh, you're wearing joy. Oh, look at that. You can't even make this thing up. Someone has a t-shirt here that says joy on it. That is awesome. Oh, yeah, yeah. So at least now you can tell people you were led by the Spirit. Oh, yeah. And so when we have power from God to move mountains, power to get things done, what we need to understand is that that power needs to translate into strength by us learning how to maintain a position of joy regardless of outcomes, regardless of situations, regardless of circumstances. You may have just healed somebody and rather than being commended for helping somebody else get up who's been crippled, you are now being persecuted for helping. You are being told you need to sit yourself down and stop using the name of Jesus. That can be demoralizing. What you need to do in a situation like that is allow yourself to rejoice in the Lord because without that joy, you will lose that power. And without that consistency of power, there is no strength. Like I told us, there is a reason why we need to come to this particular mind that no matter what it is, I have to maintain confidence in God. You know, I've shared this with you before, but for the sake of those who may not have known, there were times wherein Jesus would tell his disciples, why do you not have faith? And there are times wherein he would say to them, you have little faith. And what is the difference? Do you know that there is nobody that has no faith. I'm getting ahead of myself here, but I will explain very quickly another principle, then I'll continue from there. We started with Matthew chapter 7, verse 7, into verse 8, that spells out your assurance that God is committed to you in such a way that whatever you ask, He gives you. If you seek, you find. If you knock, the door is open to you. Is that correct? Right? Now, that assurance has many dividends. One of the dividends of that assurance is that every single one of us has been given what? A measure of faith. So basically, God will not ask you to use what he has not given to you. The Bible says, by faith, it is impossible to please God. So God knows if you don't have faith, you cannot please him. So will he be a fair God to expect you to please him when he has not given you a measure of faith? So someone says, but what is the controversy? Why would then Jesus say that they have no faith? I thought like that for a while and I was like, okay, I'm done thinking. I'm just going to go and ask because they've said if I ask, I will receive. So I asked the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit said to me, you go and read it yourself. And so when I read it myself, you know what I found? Jesus did not say to them why. Jesus did not say to them, you have no faith. He was like, have you no faith? There is a difference. He was asking about their attitude. He was saying, have you no faith? We gave you faith. Why are you then asking or acting like someone who has no faith? He asked it as a question to remind them of their privilege. 
But when he said it as a statement, what did he say? He says, oh, you of little faith. So basically, the way it works is this. God has given to everybody power. He has given to everybody a measure of faith. But you require more than just that measure of faith to live a successful life of an overcomer. You need to build on that faith. You need to have that faith consistently. And that is the reason why when he comes and he sees you not being in consistent faith, he says you have little faith. Because we come to you on a Saturday and we see that you only have a two-day faith. This faith that we're singing in you is just your Thursday and Wednesday faith. What happened to your Monday faith when you got to work and they gave you that report? So Monday, empty. Tuesday, empty. On Tuesday, you had borrowed faith because you came to service and you borrowed Antoine's faith just for the night. But all of Friday, we, had, we, we saw no faith in you. So your faith is little because you have many gaps in your walk. I will see how I can best explain that because Alan was prophesying earlier. He says we have come to a place wherein the word of God is presented with clarity and simplicity and people understand. And when he was saying that, I was thinking to myself, if only this guy knows what I'm trying to preach today. But I, I know that we're still going to get it. Now, the first time, or one of those times that Jesus says, you have little faith. He was, some, he was partially or somewhat quoting Deuteronomy 32, verse 20. In Deuteronomy 32, verse 20, God came to the children of Israel. And he was like, at this point, I need to look away. He says, I'm actually just going to look away because I can't stand your inconsistency anymore. So God was like, I will look away from you people because you're, you're getting me angry. He says, I can't keep looking at you people because one day you believe, the other day you do not believe. So what did he say to them? He says, you are a perverse generation. And Jesus called a couple of people a perverse generation. He says, oh, you wicked and perverse generation. Why is it that you have no faith? I mean, why, I mean why, you have little faith or have you no faith? Now, when God was saying that in Deuteronomy 32, 20, he said, all oh, you of no faith. Now, hear me out and let us resolve this contradiction once and for all. Take us to Deuteronomy 32, 20. The book of Deuteronomy 32, I believe it's 32, 20. Let's see, let's, let's confirm that here real quick. It says, and he said, I will hide my face from them. In fact, let's start reading from uh, verse, verse 19. It says, and when the Lord saw it, he spurned them because of the provocation of his sons and his daughters. Whenever you, are, you have faith, you please God. When you don't have faith, you provoke God. But do you always have faith? Yes. So what do we, what do we mean by when you have no faith? When you have no faith is when you're not acting faithful, when you're not operating as someone who has been given that privilege of faith. So he says, you provoke me because of your inconsistency. Verse 20 says, and he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see their, what their hand end will be, for they are a perverse generation, children in whom there is no faith. Now, God says children in whom there is no faith. Because of the fact that they were not operating consistently, it says children in whom there is no faith. Let me explain something to you here very quickly. You see, when God says in whom there is no faith, let me first of all use this expression. In the English language, we sometimes say a faithful man. A faithful man. If you remove the word faithful, what do you have? A man, right? This is the way that I remember it. And I want to teach you so that when, when you're dealing with things that challenge your position in God, you can go back to the root of the word and know what it means. So everybody wants a faithful man. The Bible says a faithful man who can find. You need a faithful man to marry. You need a faithful man to become. 
Every man needs to become a faithful man. Every woman wants to and should be married to a faithful man. God is looking for faithful men whom he can send. Just look at the world that we live in. Our world runs on faithful men. The moment you do not have a faithful man, the garden of God is in disarray. Because when God planted the garden, he put men in charge of the garden to keep, to tend. And he knows his limitations, so he brought a woman that is help that is meat and what it means is that is comparable to him that is of the same kind but just different operation and so women are somewhat responsible for the assignment that man has been given but for the woman to be able to fully be effective in the life of a man the man has to be faithful imagine if you have a wife that is helping you save money but then you have figured out a way of wasting money is she effective? Yes, in fulfilling her assignment. But are you together effective before God? No, you're not. Because you continue to constitute a, an insulation to the power that is flowing through her. So at the end of the day, however you swing it, a faithful man is required. Right? So you take the word a faithful man. Remove the word faithful. What do you have? You have a man. You see the word a man. Just exactly as it sounds is the Hebrew word for faithfulness. So when you say a faithful man, what you're saying is faithful, faithful. Right? So now, but when you break it down, how did that word a man become faithful? It is the same word that gave us a man. You know when the Bible says take the women to the, to the oracle, let them go and swear at the oracle and when they are done, they should say amen. The very first time the word amen was introduced to us, it was said, let them say amen, so be it. Simply because the root word amen means stable or consistent. <laughs> so when God says, you are low a moon, he was saying, you have no faithfulness. It didn't say you have no faith. The translators say you have no faith. But the reality of it is that that becomes a contradiction because the Bible says the gift and the calling of God, they are without repentance. When God gives a thing to you, he doesn't take it back from you. Now someone says, oh, but the Bible says that God gives and God take, takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That is true. God gives and he takes away, but he doesn't take away the same thing that he gives. <laughs> you know Job was the one who said that and what was he saying God gives blessing and he takes away fear because Job was blessed but he also had fear while he was blessed he was always afraid that he would lose his blessings the reason why Job fasted and prayed was not because he wanted to please God he was fasting and praying so that his children because they were children of a wealthy man he said, God forbid that my children curse God in their hearts while they enjoy the wealth that I gave. That was the reason why he fasted and prayed. Because it was like, my children have no problem. They always party him. Do you know that the description of the life of the children of Job did not include seeking God? The only thing that was said about the children of Job that was they, were, they never had enough parties. They would party from one person's house and go to another person's house and they would party from there and go to another person's house and party. That was all they did. And Job was like, at the end of the day, you know, God, there's poor children. I'm, I will do the fasting for them. And so when all his children were killed, he lifted up his voice and he wailed. He says, that which I fear greatly has come upon me. But by the end of his life, he had lost that fear because what God wanted to do was to take from his heart that which was occupying space for additional blessing. Half of his heart was blessing, the other was fear. And that was why when he lost the fear, the Bible says Job had at the end of his life twice as much as it had in the beginning. The reason why God, praise the Lord, is allowing for situations to shake you up and for your faith to be tried is because God has given you a measure of faith, but fear is occupying the other measure. And God wants you to learn how to eliminate that fear by bringing that fear to confront you to see what you will do in the face of that fear. Will you give in or will you give him the glory? We find that when God has given you that measure of faith, it is a gift and it doesn't take it away from you. And so the fact that he has given you that gift 
he will not come and say you have no faith because there is faith in you. What he is saying is you have no faithfulness. The word there is low iman. And that low iman, that iman is from amun. Amun means to be faithful, to be consistent. He says you have no consistency. That's why I'm looking away. You keep provoking me. One day you will say, oh, Father, we trust in you. The other day you are begging. If you truly trust in me, why are you begging? You understand? David said, I was young, but now I'm old. I have never seen the righteous forsaken nor his children begging for bread. So why are you begging? If truly your confidence is in God, why do you worry? No, let me tell you something. You can be concerned. Because it is rational to be concerned. When something happens to you, for example, you already had some, you, you had a business that's already lined up and the customer calls you and says, we're no longer interested. For a moment, you will be concerned. But okay, what did we do? What should we do? What is going on? Yes, that is concern. But if you now say, oh, it's over. Now we're dead. We're going to lose this business. Oh, they're going to come and take our house. Now that is worrying. It is not what happens to you. It is what you remain in. And it works both ways. It works both ways. Power can happen to you. But if you do not remain in power, at the end, what will become of you? You will look like someone who never had power. That was what God said in, in the verse that we just read. Deuteronomy 32, 20. He says, I will hide my face from you. And I said, in the end, we will see what will become of you. Because there is no way you can make the kind of end that we have in mind for you if you do not exercise faithfulness, stability, consistency. Believe today, believe tomorrow as you believed yesterday. Do not let there be a day of the week that you are not believing. We need to start to take a personal assessment of ourselves at the end of every week. You know, at the end of God's week, the first week of creation, at the end of the week, God took an assessment of how well himself had done. You know, because God has no counterpart. There's nobody to assess him. He had to assess himself. The Bible says besides him, there is no other. And so whenever he needs to talk to himself, he would have to go to a mirror. Say, how are you doing? Which is true. Because God says you, beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord. You are being changed into that same image because there is no one like you. He made you so unique that you can't compare yourself to another. For you to be changed, you have to look in the mirror. He says, we beholding as in the mirror the glory of the Lord, we are being changed into that same image. I am not going to become like Anita. Even though I would like to be taller, but I don't want to become like somebody else. Because it has not been given to me. The only person that I can be like is that one that is in the mirror that has attained the glory. And so whenever God needs to do anything, he has to assess himself. At the end of his creation week, the Bible says he looked at all of what he's done and he says, yeah, this is good. So that is what we're supposed to do also. Every now and again, you need to do an assessment of yourself and say, this week, how did I do? Did I operate in faith every day of the week? Was I consistent? Did I trust God every day of the week? Because I cannot afford gaps in my belief. Because I have a measure of faith, but that measure needs to be found every time the master comes calling. Every time situations knock on the door, that measure needs to be presented. It doesn't have to be a lot. It just has to be around. It has to be presented. Jesus says even if that faith is as little as a mustard seed, but that faith, you have to live like someone who has that faith. We need to be consistent. So now I'm going to summarize everything that I have just said. Come with me to Jeremiah chapter 19. We're going to read verses 11 and 13. Jeremiah chapter 19. And before we read this, I want to quickly just remind us, I know that I've mentioned it, severally but i want to remind us of the criticality of what is being shared today why is this critical why now god has promised us one thing that we have come to our year of overcoming why is overcoming important because we have spent enough time surviving god did not call us to the ministry of surviving he called us to be overcomers so we need to look back at everything that we have survived Everything that God has allowed you to survive, he has allowed you to survive so you can have a list of the things that you have to overcome. So when you look at all of what you have survived, put it down and say, I survived this, now I have to overcome it. To overcome it means to live at a level where such things do not exist anymore. 
You may have survived lack multiple times and God is saying, yeah, it's time for you to now live in abundance. I didn't call you to just survive lack. I've called you to have life that is more abundant. You may have survived loss multiple times and gotten away with things that you shouldn't do. And the Lord is saying, yes, you've, you've survived. You're still here. But now you have to be at a level wherein those advances of Satan and the flesh do not even get to you anymore. Many of us have had people that we did not talk to, that we kept grudges with, but God in his mercy continued to speak to us. God in his mercy continued to allow for us to grow. He continued to allow for us to be exposed to other believers who may be three while we were still one and a half because he wants you to become. And so the fact that you have survived all this while doesn't mean you should say, well, that is what I do. Yes, that is what you've been doing, but that is not who you are. I like the way the man of God, I believe it was Miles Monroe, who put it this way. He says, we have not been called to be human doings. We're supposed to be human beings. It's not about what I do. I can be good at doing this, but no, I need to focus on who I am to become. And who do I become? An overcomer. So when we come to that season and the Lord is saying, this is my expectation of you. I want you to overcome. He also comes to us in his goodness to let us know what could cost us that position. And the number one thing that we talked about is what? Keeping of grudges and not being at peace with other men. Holding offenses. We need to be at level three. Level one is they ask for forgiveness, you forgive them. Level two is even if they haven't asked for forgiveness, you still forgive them. Level three is you don't even have to forgive because you were not offended in the first place. <laughs> That still sounds like, oh my God, is there any level threes around? Yeah. But the reality of it is, that is where God wants you and I to be. Wherein you're not even waiting for people to ask for forgiveness because there is nothing to forgive. And when you operate at that level, you are an overcomer because what that means is you have come to sit in Christ Jesus at a place wherein people's offenses don't even get to you anymore. What exactly can they do that will touch you where you're at? When you know that all things work together for your good, even the person that is speaking evil against you, it can only work for you. The person that hates you in their heart without a cause, it will work for you. Because you know, by them hating you and talking about you, they keep mentioning your name for angels to hear. They keep registering. The Bible says God prepares a table before you in the presence of your enemies because they all came together carrying your name. And God was like, okay, now I remember my son. Everyone's talking about him. He's the talk on the lips of all of these profane people, all of these perverse people. Let me tell you something, it cannot work against you, it can only work for you. When you have that understanding, guess what? Your joy is full all the time. The reason why now is because God is letting us know that we're coming closer and closer to the end of an episode and the beginning of another. And when this other episode begins, we should be ready to take on opposition that is at a new level. And the reason why that is important is because the Bible makes it very clear that we need to brace up to be able to wrestle bigger giants. Can I have that water, please? <coughs> For the Bible says that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against what? Thank you. Against principalities and powers. And one of the things that you need when you're wrestling against principalities and powers is consistency. Can I prove that to you? There are certain spirits that have tenacity. You cannot kick them easily. You kick them, they move back, but they come back again. Let me give you an example of one of such spirits. I think John will remember this one. There was a man who brought his son to Jesus because he had an infirmity. But this man had also heard about the disciples of Jesus, that these guys go out in the name of Jesus and they do miracles. So when he came, he didn't even bother Jesus. He just went to the disciples. It was like, we heard y'all just came back from a mission strip where demons were running away from you. This one has plenty of those. Can you do something about it? And the disciples were like, nothing happened. They laid their hands, nothing happened. They laid their legs, nothing happened. And after a while they were like, you guys have a different kind of problem. I don't think Jesus does this once. The Bible says they got into an argument with the man and they were arguing. Why were they arguing? They were trying to justify their powerlessness. You know how it is when you pray for somebody and they don't get healed? They're like, maybe you don't believe enough. Maybe this and that. We don't need to make excuses. If the power is not available just yet, just go for more power. The Bible says in the day of adversity, if your strength is weak, that means you have little strength. 
no sentiments, just an honest assessment. So what do you do? Go for more power. You see, when I pray for a situation and nothing seems to be happening, I don't make excuses. What I do is like, okay, maybe I don't have enough power yet for this one. Let's go for more power. We're not blaming anybody. We're just going for more power because there's an assurance that if I ask, I will receive. And so these people were there. Praise the Lord. If I don't have it, I don't have it. It's not pride. You understand what I mean? But that's why I'm not afraid to pray for people because I pray for this one, they get healed, I pray for that one, they don't seem to manifest any healing. Okay, it's not because I'm not a good guy, it's just because maybe I don't have that kind of power yet. Well, it's a journey. So what do I do? I'm like, God, what is going on with this one? But the disciples, rather than going to Jesus, they were arguing with the man. And when Jesus saw the foolishness, he went there and he was like, what's going on here? And the man was like, well, thank you. These boys are trying to convince me that maybe this is an impossible situation. And Jesus was like, okay, what's going on with the man? Jesus asked a couple of questions, which I've shared with you before, that there are times where God wants us to be involved in the solution from the perspective of interrogation. But many of us, we want to be involved from the perspective of assumption. We just assume we know everything about the situation. It doesn't work that way. Even Jesus asked questions. He was like, how long has he been going through that? What is the nature of the manifestation? And after Jesus' questions were answered, Jesus was like, ah, I think I know what kind of spirit we're dealing with. He says, this is a mute spirit. This, and you know what the word mute, what it means? Literally, mute means to bite and not let go. So when you have someone who is mute, their mouth is closed and it's not opening. So when you are dealing with a mute spirit, you're dealing with a spirit that is very persistent, that has a hold and is not going to let go. And so when you're dealing with such a mute spirit, how do you overcome such mute spirit? Jesus says, this kind, that was after he cast it out and the disciples came to Jesus and they were like, we use the same words that you were using. If I will even use your name. How come this did not respond? Jesus says, this kind goeth not, but by prayer and fasting. What is the relationship between prayer and fasting and a mute spirit? A mute spirit is a spirit that bites down and doesn't let up. So because it doesn't let up, you can't get rid of it very easily because it's very persistent, right? And Jesus says the way you get rid of persistent spirits is not just to apply power, you also have to apply what? Strength. That was why he says this kind goeth not but by prayer and fasting. When you pray, you receive power. But when you fast, you receive strength. You see, I can just pray in a moment of desperation and say, God, please do something. And then I see God's intervention. But the reality of it is that fasting does not happen in an instant. Fasting happens when you deny yourself over a period of time. So that even when you are wanting to do that thing, like sometimes my wife will fast social media. And now that's when I will come with the most interesting stories. I'll be like, I saw something online today. And sometimes I'm like, have you seen this? I've seen that. And, and you know, sometimes when I get excited, I'm like a little child all over again. So maybe some of you don't see that, but my wife sees that all the time. And I get so fired up, I'm just like, I'm sorry, I'm fasting social media today. First of all, I feel like an unbeliever. Because I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah, you're spiritual. We are still, uh, we're working on it. You know, but the thing is, that's what fasting is. When the urge is there. Because my wife likes stories too. But she would deny herself. And sometimes she might be fasting for social media for three days. And I will come back the next day, not knowing what's going on, and say, have you clicked on that story? Sent it to you now twice. And she will say, like I told you, I'm fasting social media. That is how you build strength. By being consistent. Choose something. Or at least work with what the Lord has chosen for you. And make sure that no matter what the flesh is saying, you don't let go. You cannot address or deal with spirits that are persistent when you don't have persistence. Let me prove to you that that spirit was a persistent spirit. When that spirit left the boy and was going away, before the spirit left the boy, Jesus says, I know this spirit is a persistent spirit. Do you remember what Jesus told that spirit as the spirit was leaving? The other people, of course, they were in the flesh. They didn't see the spirit, but Jesus saw the spirit as the spirit was leaving. Jesus said to that spirit, it was like, hey, 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 do not come back. Jesus told the spirit, he says, dumb and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him. 
and enter him no more. Simply because that spirit was known to Jesus to be one of those that even when you push them back a little bit, they just give you two minutes to rest and then they come back again. We have come to a time wherein we need to learn how to be able to withstand all kinds of principalities and power. They do not call them principalities for nothing. They call them principalities because they hold on to territories until it is named after them. Remember that some of them is not given to them. They take it. Jesus says that from the days of John the Baptist, the kingdom of God has suffered violence because the violent take it by force. And so these people, these forces are so persistent that if you do not have any ounce of persistence in you, guess what happens? You cannot wrestle them because the Bible says that the weapons of your warfare are not carnal. But they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds and casting down imaginations and bringing to captivity every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of the anointing. And in addition to that, you need to bring every thought to obedience to the captivity of Christ only when your obedience is made complete. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. The Bible says when your obedience is made complete, then you can pull down strongholds and then you can bring, you can judge on disobedience. But let me tell you something. What do we see in the world today? Disobedience. Children disobedient to parents. Parents disobedient to God. Everyone is doing their own thing, seeking their own pleasure. And we are the army that heaven is banking on to make a difference. And if we are the one that God is banking on to make a difference, it cannot be business as usual. We cannot be religious people who are only using God to what? attain their own pleasure we need to be people who are ready to deny themselves so that God can get pleasure and that is the reason why this message is coming now it is coming now because of the fact that we're about to deal with principalities and powers that are in that are of the order of resilience and persistence how do we overcome if we are in today and out tomorrow and let me tell you something that which the Lord has revealed to me that will help us to be persistent, to maintain that strength that is required is joy. Are you able to stay joyful even when the interest rates are going up and your investments are going down? Are you able to stay joyful when people that you thought were people of God get exposed to be men of the occult? Are you able to continue to maintain your joy even when the same people that led you to, the, to Christ and baptized you in water and now been exposed to have come from the, from the gates of hell to plant ministries and churches and organizations in the name of God. Jesus says many will come in my name. He says, but only by their fruits shall you know them. He says, because a lot of them are of the synagogue of Satan. What do you do when you find out that the ones that you once trusted were actually implants of Satan to deceive many? We are in the age of the great deception. When that happens, if we are not well positioned in our hearts to rejoice in the face of betrayal, we will lose power, we will lose strength. You see, because those little gaps in your emotions, those little gaps in your confidence in God is what weakens your overall resolve. And God is looking for people that will be consistent, people that will not just have faith, but people that will have faith all the time to qualify for being called faithful. So the question is this that you need to ask yourself. Whenever you find yourself behaving in a manner that is not worthy of the cross, ask yourself, have I no faith? I do have faith because he has given me a measure of faith. So all I need to do right now is speak as someone who has faith. Think like someone who has faith. Believe like someone who has faith. And if I can do that, then guess what? I am responding to heaven's assurance with my persistence. Heaven has given you assurance. When my wife came up here to pray, the picture that was given to me by the Lord was that the Bible says that the Lord is coming with a shout. Are you also coming out to receive him also with a shout? The Lord is coming and is that friend that you haven't seen in a long time. What do you do when you see friends that you haven't seen in a long time? You scream and shout, hey, especially if you're Nigerian, you scream even louder, ah! And then they also say, the Bible says the Lord is coming like a Nigerian with a shout. <laughs> and let me tell you something you need to receive him also 
with a shout because deep calls unto deep. And so when you have that confidence in God that is coming for you, even when you are walking through the valley of the shadow of death, what do you do? You shout for joy. Ladies and gentlemen, I read to you from the book of Psalms last week that the Lord himself said, I want you to give a shout because I am coming to perform that which I promise. The Lord is coming to perform and he wants you to receive him with a shout. So in conclusion, we're going to break bread and the break bread, breaking bread scripture is that Jeremiah. Jeremiah, what did I ask us to go to? Praise the Lord. Jeremiah chapter 19, 11, and we will break bread with this verse of scripture. Hallelujah. Jeremiah 19, 11. He says, and say to them, thus says the Lord of hosts. God bless you, Cody. Thank you. And say to them, thus says the Lord of hosts, even so I will break this people and this city as one breaks a potter's vessel, which cannot be made whole again. And they shall bury them in Tophet, till there is no place to bury. Verse 13 says, and the houses of Jerusalem and the houses of the kings of Judah shall be defiled like the place of Tophet. Because of all the houses on whose roofs they have burned incense to all the hosts of heaven and poured out drink offerings to other gods. The Lord says, I am coming and I am coming and my coming will be doom to the ones who are not ready for the groom. Now, I read this to us because of the fact that the other day we read Genesis, I mean, Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 11. Jeremiah 9, 11 promises destruction to Israel. Jeremiah 19, 11 tells us about the destruction that is coming to Judah. So that we can be fully awake to know our responsibility is to pray for all men. At communion house, we do not take side to pray for one nation against the other. Because right now, the elitist order is presenting to us a battle between Israel and Judah. Even though they tell you it's Israel and Palestine, it is the Romans that call it Palestine. The Bible calls it Judah. Let's not forget, Palestine was a name that was introduced by the Roman overlords because of the fact that they hate the name Judah. Because they know, because of their soothsayers and their sorcerers, that one day there will be a lion that will rise out of Judah. You see, there is a lion that is coming out of Judah. And that is the reason why they demonized that land and the people thereof. You need to go and look at it and be sure you are not being deceived. The land, Palestine, is what the Bible calls Judah. That land has always been divided between Israel and Judah. Saul ruled out of where? The capital of Israel at the time. I think it was Samaria. And David ruled from where? Jerusalem. Where was Jerusalem? Jerusalem was in Judea, was in Judah. The word Judea is the same word Judah. Judea just means the land of Judah. And so that has always been the case. So all of what people are talking about today, that, oh, just eliminate the Palestines and give the land to Israel. And some people are like, no, just drive Israel out and give the land back to the owners, Palestine. It's like, no. It has always been the northern land is called Israel and the south is called Judah. Why is this important? Let me explain to you. The reason why there's never been true peace in that place is because people are trying to solve a spiritual problem with a political solution. Why did, why, did, why did Nimrod kill all the two boys two years old and below when Abraham was born? Because he was told that a star was born and that that star was going to be a champion by God. So he killed all the young boys. The same thing happened when Moses was born, right? When Jesus was born, the same thing happened. Now imagine if people were carrying out placards and protesting Herod killing young boys. 
That will be a political or social political solution to a spiritual problem because Satan was the one behind Herod, he was the one behind Pharaoh, and he was behind Nimrod. And the reason being that the Lord said in the garden to the serpent, why the serpent was there? He said to the woman, the seed of the woman shall bruise the head of the serpent. And the serpent knows that as long as this woman has a seed, he doesn't have a future. So he was trying to eliminate the seed of the woman. And that is the reason why that problem continues to happen. And it's still happening till today that many people who are well-to-do, established families and businesses and organizations and corporations are making it easy for young maidens to terminate their babies. Because the enemy is afraid of the ones that will be born. It is a spiritual problem. We're not going to tackle it by political so solutions. So what is going on in Israel is a spiritual problem. And I'll tell you what it is. The Bible says when the Messiah comes, he will alight upon the Mount of Olives. And he will establish his reign in Jerusalem. And so what does the devil do? The devil does not want him to come and establish his kingdom because as soon as he's done establishing his kingdom, the devil and his cohorts will be cast into the lake of fire this time around forever. You know that he was bound for a thousand years and then he was released again for a thousand years to deceive the nations. But when he gets thrown into the lake of fire, that is bye-bye. So he doesn't want to let up. And what he's doing in the last days is he's bringing out all of his guns. The best of his warriors are coming out. The reason why you need to be consistent is because those ones are persistent. They're not like the little devils that we dealt with. So when we see that the situation that we're dealing with is that Satan is trying to stop Jesus from being able to alight on the Mount of Olives. And so he's causing turmoil across that land. And when Jesus told us, in, in, in the book of Matthew, he said that this gospel would not have gotten to Jerusalem by the time I return. And why is he saying that? It's a little confusing because in Acts, he said to his disciples, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel, beginning where? In Jerusalem. So if he says, you begin in Jerusalem, but then it will not have gotten to all of the land of Israel until I come, help us understand. He's talking about the return of the Sabbath. When you make a sound, it goes. When it gets to the end of the perimeter, it comes back. The gospel left. Where did the gospel begin from? It began from Jerusalem. And then to where? To Judea. Before northern Israel. Jesus says, you shall be my witnesses. Where? In Jerusalem? In Judea? And where is the next place? In Samaria, the capital of northern Israel, before you go to the uttermost parts of the world. Now the gospel has reached the uttermost parts of the world and it is making its return because the Bible says the word of God does not return to him until it has fulfilled the purpose for which it was sent. That word is coming back and the devil does not want it to get back to Jerusalem to complete its work. Because the moment it completes its work, the Bible says the end shall come. How do you preach a gospel to a people that have been demonized and and you see, a month before the war started, one of the things that the Lord said to me to say to you all is this. The Lord revealed to me the principality that has been assigned this war. I saw the being behind the war and how the two aircrafts were what? Did I not tell you that the two aircrafts that I saw were the same? They are the same children of Jacob divided into two lands, Israel and Judea, which is now called Palestine. He says, but they will make it seem as though they are at war. There will actually be a war to create a turmoil. And he says, the Lord says to me to say to you, do not allow your mouth to utter that which is not the will of God. Do you know how many Christians out there today are praying for Palestine to be destroyed? How is that the will of God when the Bible says that it is not the will of God that any should perish, but that all should come to the knowledge of the saving grace? We are not to take sides with any party, any nation or anyone. We only take sides with the Lord because we know that the Lord God Almighty has chosen to save all men, regardless of what you are told they are or what they are not. And what is happening has to happen because it's been prophesied. Jeremiah 9-11, Jerusalem will be destroyed. Jeremiah 19, 11, all of Judah will be destroyed. The Lord prophesied it. Acts chapter 4, verse 26, 27, 28, the Lord says Israel will be destroyed. And so what do we have here? We have these nations going through the judgment of God, not because of political failures or misdemeanor, but simply because of the fact that they dealt with gods in the past and they have to pay in the present. 
let me tell you something. Our obedience must be made complete. We don't have to be popular. They don't have to like us. Jesus promised that, that already. He says we'll be hated even by our brothers. We will become a reproach to our mother's children simply because of the zeal of the Lord's house. My zeal is for the Lord's house. And the Lord says, I want my children in my house. Whether they're from Judea or Samaria. I want them in my house. It is not your place to demonize anybody. So that is the reason why you and I need to pray. The Bible says pray for all men. Someone says, oh, but why would the devil go through all that trouble? Number one, the devil does not even know that he's fulfilling scripture. Number two, the devil knows that he cannot take us when we're united. So he wants to keep us divided. To take sides. The same way that the West is being poisoned against Palestine is the same way that the East is being poisoned against Israel so that we can be divided. So I tell you today, do not be of the division. Be of salvation. Let us be for souls. Let us be for victory. I say all of that not because I was intending to say it, but when the Lord told me that as we break bread, we needed to look into this, I figured it was important for many of us to know that. And what I'm telling you, I want to encourage you, is not necessarily for you to go and make a post about it. And I will tell you why. Some people have already pledged their allegiance to Satan. Do not cast your pearl before swine. Do not give holy things to dogs. Anyone that you find online that is barking their faces off is a dog. You don't have to engage them because their mission is to drain your strength. They want to argue you into the ground. The same time that you're supposed to use and understanding what's going on in the cosmos, appreciating what's already written in scripture, they want to draw you out into arguments. Jesus told John, he says, a time is coming wherein those who are ignorant will remain ignorant still. Those who are unrighteous will remain unrighteous still. But for you, trim your wick because your bridegroom is coming. The bridegroom is coming. You, as a friend of the bridegroom, you need to be available to do the will of the Father. So let's go ahead right now and just thank God for the body and the blood of Jesus as we break bread. Let's just give him thanks for the privilege that we have in him that is not given by man, but that is given by God himself through the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Let us thank him because we're aware that with much privilege comes much responsibility. And the responsibility that we have is not to join the ones who have not heard God, is not to join the false witnesses to speak an abomination. The responsibility that we have is to listen to that which the Lord is saying. And like Jesus says, that which I say is what I hear my father say. To make sure that we speak the mind of God regardless of the sentiment that has gone into the world. The heat is being turned up, but we will maintain consistency we will maintain stability we will stay faithful we will be men who speak the will of God even when others are saying there's a casting down we will say there is a lifting up and we will go ahead right now and receive the bread as Jesus says this is my body broken for you we receive the wine as his blood that is poured out and Lord Jesus we thank you because your word says as often as we have the opportunity to do this in remembrance of you and we have an opportunity again in sweet fellowship with one another and with your Holy Spirit to receive your body and drink of your blood in remembrance of you. Let our eyes be open to see great and mighty things that we do not know. You may eat and you may drink in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So the last thing that I'm going to say, or one more thing that I'm going to say before we leave here is because of time, I'm just going to go through it very quickly. Matthew chapter 28. I'm just going to, it's, again, it's one of those things we don't have time to get into, but it has to get into us. So just let's read it together and then you go home and meditate upon it. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 28 verse 2, and behold, there was a great earthquake for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. When you hear of that great earthquake, 
just know that once again the angel of the Lord has descended to make a way for the one that was risen and taken up from us to return to us that we may be arisen. When you hear of it, look up. When you hear of it, have assurance. When you hear of it, let your joy be full because soon you will hear of it. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Praise God. So Alan is going to come up, or maybe Chris, whoever is doing the announcements. But before they come, um, the Lord put this on my heart, which is, like I told you, this is not something that I normally do unless the Lord is telling me to do it. The Lord said to me that when the prophet had a need, he went to the widow of Zarephath and he says, I need a cup of water. The woman brought a cup of water and the prophet says, that's good, but I need more. I need a loaf of bread. And the woman says, I do not have. And the man of God says, you will have. And she had. And so I appreciate those people who have continued to support this work financially. And you have given that which you have. But I want you to trust God to enable you to be able to do more. To be able to do more because I received a message from um, the caretaker of the building on behalf of the landlord and just letting us know that there's a lot of things going on. And so they're asking um, for us to be able to pay more money to continue to use the facility and all of the equipment that is in there. And the total bills come to about 5,800. And someone's been raised to give 1,300. So just one person and his wife, praise God. And so, hallelujah. And so we still have 4,500. And one of the things that we know we're doing is we're doing this also to be a blessing to the other uh, believers and ministries that use this building. So we have about four or five now ministries that use this facility. And so in order for us to be able to say that we are not just receivers, but that we're also givers because it is more blessed to give than to receive. I want us to go the extra mile. And when you go the extra mile, just... Do as much as you can, as you have proposed in your heart. But then again, like the widow of Zarephath, ask that the Lord will give you. The Bible says he gives bread to the eater and seed to the sower. Don't just limit yourself to what you have to immediately give. Believe that you can do more. And as the Lord blesses you, remember this house and remember all of what it means to the other ministries as well that, you know, may not be able to do as much as we are able to do. So I just want to encourage you, even from beginning, beginning from tonight, let us pull our weight for the sake of this work. Alrighty. Now, lastly, who's doing the announcements today? Chris is doing the announcement and Kayla. Before they come up very quickly, I have a leading in my heart to pray a quick prayer. And, and if you can wait for two more minutes because I see somebody walk out the door, this is a quick prayer. It's going to be a two-minute prayer and I don't want you to miss it. While I was seeking the face of the Lord concerning today, one of the things that the Lord reveals to me is that we need to learn how to concern ourselves with the things that concern God. And so I'm going to pray for you today that the Lord would allow for you to see what he sees. It will change the way you pray. Some of us will experience this before the 4th of November. So when we come here on the 4th of November, we will pray the mind of God with utmost clarity. So from wherever you might be, I want you to arise if you can, and just place your hand over your eyes. And just place your hand over your eyes and say, Lord, let me see what you see. Open my eyes to see from your perspective. And with humility of heart, let me accept that which you show. And draw from the strength that you have already given. I will not faint but I will pray. I will not give up, but I will be persistent unto the very end. Now open your eyes and I declare over you that seeing, you will see. Hearing, you will hear. And perceiving, you will perceive. Because today the Lord has visited us with heightened sensitivity, with clarity, with insights that we may be thoroughly furnished unto every good work in Christ Jesus. Be seated. God bless you. We'll be out of here in three minutes.
Amen. So I have to say, uh, I think one of the biggest things that I took away from today's message was when Pastor Moses mentioned, it's not what happens to you, but what remains. And that struck a chord deep with me. So um, I know that word probably cut and uh, definitely healed a lot of us in here just hearing that. So, so just want to give God praise for that in and of itself. Um, you can see the given details, as Pastor uh, mentioned, um, the need of the, the house and the facilities. So you can see the given details on the screen. I'll give you a minute to, um, you know, do what you need to do to get that situated and be a blessing to this house. All right. Heavenly Father, we just ask that you bless the hearts that, that give and bless the hearts that wanted to give but may not have had it, Father. We just thank you for just being the awesome Omega Lord that you are and just being the, the giving, merciful Father that we've come to know and that we're continually coming to know. And we just ask that you just bless this house, bless this ministry, keep us lifted up and protected and covered in your son, Jesus' blood. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Just very quickly, I want us to do something. Um, next week, we have a couple of people that will be leading us in prayer, and they're here. Uh, the worship team will be leading us in prayer in their own way. So people like uh, Diamond, um, Shayla, and my brother Ron, I want us to lift them up in prayer this week. And then pray for Emmanuel and the team as well. You see, because we are in this together. So this is our season of drawing strength and also helping to equip others, okay? So let us pray for all of these people that I mentioned. Brother Ron, can you please stand up? Diamond, stand up. Shayla is not here, but we pray for her also. Emmanuel is not here. He's going to minister somewhere else. Somewhere else we pray for them. Let's pray for these people that as they stand here, that they will be able to pour out of that which the Lord has put in side of them. I pray for you that on the day virtue is going to lead you. Ayana, you're going to be joining them. So why don't you stand up? We're going to pray for you as well. The 4th of November, you're going to be on the stage also. Praise God. Let's celebrate Ayana, everybody. God is good. All righty. God is good. How many people remember her? She was one of the first worship leaders that we had when we moved into this building. Oh, yeah. She's been out of commission, but praise God, she's back. Now, very quickly, I want my wife, Manuelita, Kenyatta, Alan, Diamond, and John to come on stage. I want to pray for all of you all real quick. So these are some of the people that will be leading us in prayer also on the day. All righty? So, Brother Ron, can you please join these people? So these are the faces and the voices, by the grace of God, that will be leading us in prayer on the 4th. Um, the other person that is not here that will be joining them is uh, Roberta. Roberta is going to be here. So I want us to just stretch forth our hands toward these people, that as we go into this week, the Lord is the one that prepares us. The Lord already says that I'm the one that will perform that which I have said. So the unction with which to function in the capacity of lead intercessors, you will walk in it more than you have ever done. This week, your equipping by the Lord will not pass you by. You will not miss out on your equipping. You will find it within yourself in humility and grace to submit to the leading of the Lord. You will be obedient to his voice. This week, in such a consistent fashion, that when you show up here by the grace of God to serve, come no slumber November, you will be delivering by the power of the Holy Spirit in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. All righty, God bless you. Let's celebrate them, everybody. God is good. Kayla. And I'm going to confess one thing real quick. The reason why I had to call them up is because I was going to ask them to see me on Tuesday after the meeting. And the Lord says, why? I said, because I want to help them prepare. And he says, no, I'm preparing them. I'm like, okay. God bless you. I don't, I don't even know how to follow that up. Uh, <laughs> that was wonderful. Um, so we're just moving to um, the family teaching family dinner and teaching on Tuesday at 6.30. Uh, so please join us for family dinner and teaching.
to second watch on Wednesday at 9 a.m. at Communion House on Instagram. That's all. Did I say a.m.? 9 p.m., please. Wednesday at 9 p.m. <laughs> I'll start it at 9 a.m. You guys join in at Communion House on Instagram. And um, the, the much uh, no slumber November, 6.30, November 4th. Yes. Okay. Brother Allen, come on up. Let's celebrate them, please. God is good. <laughs> God is good. Amen. Amen. Oh, thank you, sir. I'm not going to hold this. Look, we keep talking about it. And I want to encourage us. One thing that the man of God brought to us was if you're so led to share a personal post, you know, about the meeting um, of what the Lord has placed on your heart, testimony even, just so that those that are to see this can see it, do so. Be encouraged this week. I'm excited for us. We have our, our marching orders and we'll go from there. Everyone have a blessed night.